welcome to ICU Fellowship Prepcast. Hi, I'm Maddie. Hi, I'm Swapnil. And this has been more than a year now since we recorded our episode last year. Maddie, welcome back. Amazing news. So congratulations on having a baby boy. Thank you. How's things on your side and how's this transition going? Uh, it's good. So had a kid, Kayan. He's very cute. He's almost nine months old now. And I've been back at work for about a month, which is like a big change, but I think a good change. I feel like my brain is working again slowly, but he's at a very good age and um, he's a he's a cutie. But now just trying to manage the sort of transition with coming back to work and having more responsibilities at home. Hats off to you and all the female ICU doctors who manage their career and family. It, it, I can't even imagine myself doing that. It, it's just such a hard task to manage two things and, and still function at a very highest level. So well done and welcome back to the podcasting journey again. Oh, thanks. Good to be back. And also good job, everyone who sat the ridden, what, last week or just over a week ago. And yeah, I hope it went well for you. Yeah, the results will be out soon. The marking period has just began. So, so this year with Fellowship Papers, I guess there has been a lot of positive feedback about the podcast. Although there was a big break last year, I think a lot of people did benefit from listening to the Fellowship Papers. And there was more, like there was a request for more episodes with a similar theme. Only thing that we're going to change now, given that our previous episodes were 30 minutes long, I think... Some of the candidates felt that it might be beneficial that we switch to similar format of primary prepcast, which is small snippets uh, where we discuss one viva or one case management. And that way it's much easier to consume that episode. So we are switching to this snippet format. So the first snippet for today is a 59-year-old male who presents to an outer metropolitan hospital which is supported by a non-tertiary ICU with a severe respiratory failure. He gives a history of a weak cough, myalgia, fever, and increasing shortness of breath. So what is your differential diagnosis in this patient? So there are multiple potential causes for his presentation. Most likely, I think top of my differential would be an infectious etiology, whether bacterial, viral, fungal, or parasitic but his presentation could also be secondary to non-infectious causes. So in terms of infectious causes, bacterial causes could be a community-acquired pneumonia, such as strep pneumonia or an atypical pneumonia, such as mycoplasma or legionella, could be infective endocarditis or a sepsis from another source with multi-organ involvement, such as a septic joint or meningitis. Viral causes they include things like well, COVID or CMV, fungal causes, especially if the immunosuppressed person could be a candidemia or aspergillosis, or parasitic causes such as malaria, possible if there's been a recent um, significant travel history. Non-infectious causes, I think, so have to be part of your differential, but generally we'd exclude infectious causes first. Cardiovascular non-infectious causes would be something like cardiac failure or a PE, inflammatory causes such as a vasculitis or uh, aspiration pneumonitis, elder immune causes such as SLE, neoplastic causes such as lymphangitis carcinomatosis, or other potential causes like a drug toxicity, COPD, or neuromuscular causes such as neurogenic pulmonary edema are potentials, but I think would be less likely. Thanks, Mary. So that's a quite comprehensive list of differential diagnosis. Now, fellowship, why was the STEM is there for a reason? So what are the other aspects of the history that would be important for you to help or confirm a specific infective etiology for his presentation? Yeah, so specific things about the presenting complaint that would help confirm an infective etiology would be other localizing symptoms other than the respiratory features such as the cough and shortness of breath that we get in the stem. So things like if there were soft tissue symptoms like increased erythema in an area or painful joints, any neurological symptoms which might make you think of things like a meningitis or other localizing pathology that might confirm a sepsis with a respiratory involvement. Um, and then further information about things like if the cough was productive, might, might make you more concerned about a, a pneumonia or a upper respiratory tract infection. 
Then specifically things like comorbidities. So immunosuppression would be very important to know about, such as if the patient had malignancy or steroid use or renal failure. So this would tailor some of your thoughts towards infections in the immunocompromised host. Things like lung disease, such as asthma or COPD, which increases the risk of pneumonia. Splenectomy would increase the risk of encapsulated organisms. And any presence of lines, such as ports or devices, which would increase the infection risk because of a foreign body in situ. Smoking, we know, has an increased risk of pneumonia, especially things like Legionella, pneumococcal and staph. And same with heavy alcohol use. And intravenous drug use, so which would increase the risk of bloodborne infections such as endocarditis or staph aureus. And then thinking specifically about particular exposures, so unwell contacts may help identify the organism of route of transmission, such as if the other contacts had a respiratory illness or a gastrointestinal illness. Travel and immunization history may help to identify sort of endemic organisms and travel related diseases. Things, other exposures like exposures to birds would increase your risk of chlamydia, psittacosis, or gardenings, which would increase your risk of Legionella long beachae. Unprotected sex, so risk of HIV or seroconversion illness or immunocompromise. And recent antibiotic use increases the risk of like multi resistant organisms. And then things like more weird and wonderful things like exposure to tropics in the wet season or flooding. So the potential of things like meliodosis or leptospirosis or encounter with things like farm animals, which could increase the risk of um, chlamydia or Q fever. Thanks, Mary. And from here, the VIVA can branch out into various different directions. So let's say you explored further history and you found that this patient is quite healthy apart from there's a 20 pack year history of smoking but otherwise there's no further history of any drug or alcohol use on further probing you notice that he had been recently to brussels at isicm conference and he has returned only last week so what investigations would you perform to aid in your diagnosis of the infection causing his respiratory failure? So these could be divided into blood tests, imaging, and some other potential tests. So blood tests would be initially a standard test, such as a full blood count. So a leukocytosis, a leukopenia, or a neutrophilia can indicate a bacterial cause, whereas a lymphocytosis could indicate a viral cause. Then organ functions, such as a UEC, Hypernatremia is more common in Legionella and deranged LFTs are more common in Legionella, chlamydia, psittacosis, or Q fever infection. Trying to find the specific organism with atypical serologies. So this, this looks at mycoplasma, Legionella, and chlamydia, and blood cultures, which could grow a bacteria to help identify the organism. Then imaging a chest x ray give you further clues because, like, loba consolidation is more likely in bacterial pneumonia, such as strep pneumonia, whereas multiloba or cavitation may suggest organisms like staph aureus and there might be more non-specific changes in, in viral etiologies. A CT chest can also give you further information. There are particular signs you might see, such as halo signs and asp- aspergillosis. They can give you a further information compared to a chest x-ray. And then certain other tests, so a sputum MCS, if there is a productive cough, can help identify an organism. Urinary antigens, standard in the workups we do for uh, for pneumonias. Um, so this looks at strep pneumonia and Legionella pneumophila and a respiratory viral nasopharyngeal swab, which, which checks a lot of the viruses. There's a whole list which will be in the show notes. And it also tests for mycoplasma pneumonia in some of these swabs, despite saying it's a viral swab. Yeah. So if you're preparing for fellowship, I think returned overseas travel itself is a big theme. And again, examiners might pick one specific infection from all the causes that Maddie listed. And then I guess the VIVA can further branch into the management of that particular organism. Now, another reminder, what Maddie did there was about the, when you are stating any investigation, you need to state what you're looking for when you're ordering that particular investigation. So rather than just verbalizing the list of investigations, be more specific about when you order this particular investigation, what you're looking for. So let's say you send all these investigations and the Legionella urinary antigen comes back positive. Can you please outline the transmission of the Legionella and also what are the other methods available to diagnose Legionella pneumonia? 
So I thought it'd be worthwhile just briefly talk about the microbiology. So Legionella aerobic gram negative intracellular bacilli. And there are more than 50 species, but the two most common that are pathogenic in humans is Legionella pneumophilia, which is mostly serogroup 1, and Legionella long beachae. So the Legionella pneumophilia thrive in warm water, and they grow readily in closed man-made water systems. So this includes plumbing fixtures or air conditioner units. They're transmitted by inhalation of aerosols, mostly from contaminated water sources such as showers, pools, aquariums, and air conditioners. It can also rarely, but documented as occurred by aspiration of contaminated water or ice, but it cannot be spread person to person. So the urinary antigen only detects Legionella pneumophila serogroup 1 and not Legionella long beachae species, but the urinary antigen positives of it is the very rapid test. Other methods available to diagnose Legionella pneumophila, PCR serology or culture, So PCR, this can be used on sputum, urine, and serum. It's fast, but it's not available in some labs. It's pretty sensitive at 95% sensitivity, but very specific, over 99%. And it can detect species other than Legionella pneumophila, so that's useful. The serology, it's the most accurate interpretation needs acute and convalescent serology four weeks apart which makes that a bit tricky to use in the acute situation. It's more useful for epidemiological information. The criteria for a positive includes a four times increase in the TETA to a ratio of 1 to 128 or higher. But a single high TETA IgG or positive IgM is suggestive of an infection, but it's not confirmatory. Um, It is sensitive, but less sensitive than PCR, but also very specific, greater than 99% specificity. And then the culture is considered the gold standard, but this requires a specialized media and it generally requires a bronchoscopic sample. Um, Expectorated sputum can be used, but it's less ideal because it can be contaminated with oral flora and have a relatively low Legionella content. And this is a slow test, so it takes five to seven days to grow and is technically difficult. So in practice, mostly like uh, urinary antigens are good for Legionella pneumophila, but other tests, we sometimes do a, a PCR generally. Thanks, buddy. So very important thing is to understand the microbiology a little bit in more detail. And that's why all those antimicrobial stewardship rounds that happen in most of the ICUs are quite useful to understand these different organisms and which tests are useful. This question was asked in fellowship exam last year. And a lot of candidates did very poorly because they couldn't answer about Legionella Long Beachy. So again, use those ID ward rounds to your advantage by asking experts questions about why we order Legionella PCR. Why can't we just go with the urinary antigen test results? Let's talk about some of the treatment aspects. Which antimicrobial agents would you consider if the diagnosis is Legionella pneumophilia? So this also depends on the severity of illness, but this particular patient has severe respiratory failure requiring ICU admission. So we treat as a high severity Legionella pneumonia. And so this is generally with azithromycin 500 milligrams intravenously or ciprofloxacin 400 milligrams intravenously Q8 hourly. Combination therapy with azithromycin and ciprofloxacin or, or with rifampicin plus azithromycin or ciprofloxacin is occasionally used in high severity cases, but this has not been shown to improve outcomes. Azithromycin does have pretty good bioavailability. So if the gut absorption is thought to be good, then we can make this an oral treatment as well. And the duration of therapy is generally seven to 10 days, unless the patient is immunocompromised or develops complications, in which case it's longer. Great. Thanks, buddy. So what are some of the public health implications if you get notified about this diagnosis by the micro lab? So it's important to know that Legionella is a notifiable disease. So it requires you as a clinician to notify the public health unit, although sometimes in some hospitals the lab does this. The public health unit will then interview the patient and or the relatives to get collateral history about possible exposures. And if there are two cases that are linked by time and place, then the sources of infection are assessed because for Legionella pneumophila, as I said, it was through water sources. So they they will then investigate whether there's a potential contamination of a site and, and then try and treat that. Yeah, that's correct. And especially if you're working in a regional remote settings, uh, which is uh, for relevant to this particular 
viva then it could have a lot of significant logistical implications where you might have to start investigating quite uh, in uh, the, the outbreak and also that means sometimes you might have to move patients to other units so thanks madi so that's the end of our today's snippet we'll be back with another snippet in weeks time till then goodbye and have a nice time thanks for listening see you next time <laughs>